We are approaching the Passover, and uh, usually there's some feelings that sometimes overwhelm us. But brethren, have you ever felt bogged down, spiritually speaking? Kind of like your spiritual legs are stuck in the mud. Well, it can actually make us feel panicky when we don't feel like we are making any forward movement. No doubt at that stage we'll be wondering if God is even listening to us. Are our prayers even going anywhere? Maybe you feel like you have approached that condition now, right now in your life, or that you have been there for a while. What we all want indeed, otherwise we wouldn't be here, I'm sure, is a dynamic spiritual life where miraculous things are happening in our lives. Our prayers are being answered. We are getting yes, we are getting no, we are getting direction, dynamic, miraculous direction. It's a situation where we don't question, we know that our Father hears our every word. That is the dynamic life that we all want, don't we? Now, how do we get there? Well, the remedy is found, unsurprisingly, in Christ's example. Dynamic, miraculous, unwavering faith and faithfulness are words that are instantly associated with the life and the works of Jesus Christ. What made Christ so effective, spiritually speaking? That's a good question. Well, please go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. One of the great and endearing aspects of Christ's life is what he did for each one of us, obviously, and we are, each one of us are in the period of pre-Passover examination, self-examination. Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ dying for us made him unique among all who have ever lived. His life was the only sinless life that has ever existed on this planet. His life could pay the penalty, the death penalty that we each had earned through our sins. What Christ did was necessary on our part. Before we even knew that the need existed, Christ did this. He and our Father were looking ahead as to what would be necessary for each one of us or anyone else to be able to have a reconciled relationship with with them. We need to let that soak into our minds. When we consider the dynamic life that Jesus Christ lived, we see that his focus was primarily on what? Well, it was primarily on the needs of others. As a physical man, he has physical needs just like any of us do, but he wasn't fixated on them as the carnal man would be at first. He gave priority to the needs of others. Please go to 1 John chapter 4. John is known as the Apostle of Love anyway. So, as Christ gave his life out of love for us, we read now in the first epistle of the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ, First John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. You see, becoming able to begin, to truly begin to love as God loves is another aspect of our great need. We need to be able to love the way that Christ loves. Of course, that comes through the uh, to the certain state, which is a reconciled mind, reconciled with God. We cannot be reconciled, of course, without having our penalty, death penalty being paid for, and that's what Christ did for us out of his love, and of course, in accordance with Father's will. So what we see is that not only was Christ focused on the needs of others, but he also loved to the level of always being able and willing to take the first step toward that fulfillment, toward the need of others. Now again, he did this for us when we were actually his enemies. We didn't have any great value on the name of Jesus Christ, did we? Well, we we were listening to false gospels, brethren, and we heard about perhaps the name of Jesus Christ, but you know, the true Jesus Christ and what is his role in our lives never made sense to us before we were called. You know, we didn't have any great value on, on the name of Jesus Christ. He did it for us as our enemies. And that is something we need to think about as we contemplate our own spiritual life, especially now in this period of preparation for the Passover. This all defines the dynamics of what made Christ effective spiritually. It had nothing to do with self-interest, self-centeredness, self-focus. Being self-focused will choke down our effectiveness spiritually. It will stop any forward movement. It can leave us wondering if God is even listening. Is he hearing my prayers? It can leave us feeling empty inside. When we follow Christ's example, we find a reassurance. We are in First John, please go to chapter 3, verse 16, which says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now indeed, this is the echo 
from the Gospels that you know, the famous words of Jesus Christ, that no greater love has one but the one who lays down his life for his friends. Yes, indeed. Now, we are all familiar with this, but for others who perhaps would be listening to this for the first time, maybe first time they'll hear it, I just want to clarify that the word translated as love here is agape. It's the Greek word agape that has nothing to do with the lustful, self-centered and commonly accepted meaning given to that word in this world. This love, agape, is characterized by benevolent, outgoing concern for others. It's selfless. We are assured of God's love for us because, you see, he filled our need. We had a deep need and he filled it even before we were aware of it. So we know something very definitely. Jesus Christ didn't do anything that he did for us to get the praise of others. It was done from a completely selfless motivation. It was done in love to fill our needs. That is how we can be assured of God's love toward us. It leaves us feeling very special, very privileged inside. We feel whole and we can feel alive. That is the outworking of real love according to God. Because love has that impact on us, brethren. And because it does, we should obviously do the same for others in the same selfless sort of a way with you know, our attention on their needs. Christ did it for us when we were ignorant of him. We should be willing to do the same thing for others, for anybody. So let's go to verse 17. How do we lay our lives down? How do we do that? Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see, only Christ could lay his life down to cover the penalty of sin for others. And that is something that we cannot do for each other, obviously. But John clearly shows that there is a way that we can lay our life down for others. It is the same as what Christ did in principle. You know, it is by filling their needs. That is how we lay down our lives. John is referring to physical needs, of course. We need food, we need shelter, we need clothing, etc. We need those basics. When any of us have missed several meals, and most of us have done that in, at some time in our life, well, we definitely feel the need for food. It's not just a want, it's a genuine need. If we lose shelter, there is a gender that is genuine need. Because we have had genuine needs at one time or another, we know what they look like. We can recognize the symptoms. John's point is that just seeing those needs and acknowledging them verbally without feeling them in deed and in truth is not following Christ's example. So how is God's love therefore a living part of us? John has explained that we can see the needs of others, we can talk about those needs, or just think about them but do nothing to try to fill them, proving that God's love doesn't abide in us. Or we can see those needs in others, and again, including those who are com completely ignorant of God's way of life. Well, perhaps somebody who is, who is brand new to the church, you know, he has just discovered the church of God, he wants to become a part of it, or something of that sort, you know. We can lay our life down for them by filling the needs to whatever degree we are able. We can't always do everything, of course, but whatever we are able. There, thereby, we can prove God's love is in us, which again is a very comforting thing. That's something that fills us, you know. Verse 19, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Well, you see, when we truly fill the needs of others, we, we can know that we are not deceived in what we profess to be. What we profess to be, what we profess to be children of God in embryo state. When we follow Christ's example, we are assured of God's love toward us and of God dwelling in us, and that gives us stability. We won't have to wonder if he hears us. We can be assured of it. Verse 20, for if our hearts condemn us, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Well, there is no possible way that we can fake God out as to what is in our heart, brethren. Well, he can read it very, very easily, whatever is in there. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. John is talking about God's perception of our heart and not of our, you know, our own perception of our heart. I think we all know that a heart that does not condemn us is one that is fully committed to living God's way of life, to overcoming throughout life. It is a heart that doesn't want to fall from grace. The heart that doesn't condemn us is one that seeks to actively fill the needs of others. It aligns our heart with God, it aligns our thinking with God's thinking, that again 
gives us confidence. Verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Well, all the things that we have talked about initially are answered here, brethren, in this very verse. We can be close to God and we can know it. We can know that our prayers are heard, our spiritual life can be miraculous and dynamic. And by that, I hope we are not thinking in terms of, well, things, you know, appear out of nowhere. Things like that happen. We can have divine healings, like we had the example of, you know, several months ago, etc., etc. But miraculous things are basically interventions from God. They're answers to the questions we have. They're solutions. Those things are dynamic. Hopefully, we can see that the filling of the needs of others is the equivalent of laying our lives down for one another. That is the foundation of a dynamic spiritual life. Now, as we contemplate this, we might remember, oh, well, I remember helping brethren at one point in time, or maybe a neighbor who needed some help at one point with some of the physical needs that John talked about. You know, I can remember doing that a time or two through the years and it produced an uplifting feeling. Well, you see, it fills the principles that John has laid out for us. So by all means, we don't want to stop doing those things, don't we? We might say to ourselves, well, I'm not sure that it made my spiritual life miraculous and dynamic. And although it did move me forward in a spiritual sense in my development, yes, although it did that, but it I'm not sure that made my spiritual life miraculous. Well, that's if it moved us forward in a spiritual sense in our development, that's good. But there is more to it than just filling the physical needs because the principle that John has laid out is exactly like one of the Ten Commandments in that there is a physical and there is a spiritual side to it. The physical needs are very easy to see and in a sense they are easy to fill because we can see them. Now, there are so many other needs that we all have that often are not recognized or even considered because they are spiritual in nature. Why would John leave those things out of the conversation? Well, John is talking about receiving what we petition God about. Such answers are miraculous. They are dynamic. We know from James that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So we want to see healings, how indeed we do. We want to see interventions, or we can reflect on the faithful of Hebrews 11, some of whom went to their deaths in persecution because they refused to deny Christ. All these things are miraculous things, brethren, and they are dynamic. So did John leave the spiritual needs out of this conversation? Well, of course he did not. Of course he did not because, you know, he said, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see, God's commandments illuminate for us what that which is pleasing in His sight. And we have already seen what is pleasing in these verses here. God is pleased when we lay our lives down for each other, which is synonymous with filling each other's needs. What is it that defines our spiritual needs but the law of God, the Ten Commandments? John didn't leave anything out here at all, brethren. He defined the very first set of needs. Food, shelter, clothing, etc., those physical things. The second set of needs are spiritual in nature, and they are defined by God's law, the Ten Commandments. They too have a physical side. The Ten Commandments have a physical side, and then they uh, have this vast spiritual side on the back side. These needs are universal among all peoples. Well, the first one, we need to have no greater gods, no other gods before God, indeed. When that need is not met, met, all we can possibly have is chaos, which is what the earth was without form and void. Without God, we are easily blown around in the pursuits of whatever seems right to me, and that is why we have the chaotic society that we have today. Another universal need is we need to bow down and serve God in spirit and in truth. Now when that need is not met, faith is destroyed. How can we possibly live in an effective life without faith? Now many in their various religions, they pray before an inanimate object and so they put their faith in that object and that totally destroys faith in God. Another need universal, which is universal, is that we need to honor God's name continually because it helps us to be ever mindful of the God who made us and who can bless us in life. The fourth one is that we need to keep the Sabbath holy. When that need is not met, 
that person will forget God and will forget the rest of the commandments as well, you know. Then the life that we live is an, an, an anchored life that can go virtually anywhere. Another need, universal, the fifth one, we need to honor our parents if we want to long live, to live long life and be blessed by God. Well, think of a culture where the elderly are not respected. The sixth thing is that we need to esteem all life as precious. We were all made in God's image and we need to see the value in all human life. Another need, the seventh one, universal need, is that we need to give and receive fidelity as mates. That is desperate need for the family to thrive. That's a need for a family, that's a need for a community, that's a need for a whole country, if you wish. The eighth one is that we need to live the give way instead of taking what doesn't belong to us. One is a culture that you feel totally unsafe in. The ninth universal need is that we need to speak only the truth and not to lie. The truth sets us free. There is no possible harm that can come from it. Lies destroy. We can see the need then for this commandment, don't we? We see the need, you know, thou shalt not lie. Also, we need to be happy when our neighbor, whether it's a, me, a male or female or a couple, has something that we don't have. And at the same time, we should be developing and thinking about the many blessings that we have in our own life, whether they are lesser or greater, whatever they might be. We need to refine the ability to be thankful for what we have in our own lives. It gives us stability. It gives us ongoing power down the stretch to endure. Now, all of these commandments we need. I've just listed ten of those universal needs. Brethren, you see, this is all corresponding to the commandments. We need them desperately. When all of these needs are met, there is one result. Romans 13, verse 8. When all of those needs are met, Romans 13, 8, the result is, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Then verse 9 continues. For the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does not harm to, does not harm, no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Well, Nothing could be simpler, could be any simpler than what we have just stated. You know, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of these needs. When these needs are met, the needs that we have of the Ten Commandments, love is what will ensue. In John 15 and verse 13, Jesus Christ himself said, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down on his life for his friends. Well, we lay down, you know, our life by filling each other's needs physically and in the spirit. Bear in mind again what John said happens when we do that. He said, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. A dynamic, miraculous spiritual life is what happens. Emptiness disappears. No more wondering if God is even listening to us. No more feeling bogged down spiritually. Miraculous answers, prayer, miraculous interventions await those who knowingly and willingly lay down their lives for others. Let's bring this thing of keeping the commandments to life. Keeping the commandments to life is, well, let's, let's put a face, let's put a face on it in terms of filling the needs of others. First of all, we need to acknowledge what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7 verse 14. He says that God's law is spiritual in nature. It's not just the do's and don'ts, you know. It's just you no know, do's or don'ts or of a physical law of any kind. This law, the spiritual law, the, the, the law of God is spiritual, it's eternal. It's something that is kept in the spirit through the desire of the inner man. It goes down to what is inside of our hearts, what is inside of us, you know, what motivates us. It's why... We do what we do or we, why we don't do what we should do. We have also the Pharisees in the Christ time, another example of a wrong approach. The Pharisees, they saw the law as a list of do's and don'ts. They didn't understand the spiritual side of the law. That's what we must understand, my dear friends. We must understand the spiritual side of the law. 
You know, Christ teaches us in Matthew 5, verse 20. He teaches us something very important and says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Want to see a strong warning? Because the law was not spiritual to the Pharisees, brethren. Uh, there was no interchange in these individuals. It was just a physical law. It was a do or a don't. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the old, to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Well, the best translation is in the danger of Gehenna. So Christ is making the point, there is a much more to the law than just the physical thing. As we see here with this particular commandment, murder, not murder, it takes place first in the mind. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, Christ has just used these two examples, murder and adultery, and that is more than enough. We get the picture to show us that sin takes place in the mind before it ever gets to the latter. The spiritual side of adultery is far broader. Adultery in the letter or in the spirit is just a type of being adulterous toward God. Because God talks about this very thing in his relationship with the house of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 9. Ezekiel 6 9. Then those of you who escape will remember my, me among the nations where they are carried captive because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which has departed from me and my by their eyes which played the harlot after the idols. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations. You see, God let the ten tribes of Israel go into captivity because they were empty inside. They were bogged down spiritually. When we get into this empty state, brethren, we'll always try to fill it the wrong way. Instead of filling the needs of others, we try to fill it our own way. Because the house of Israel became so occupied with self, so self-occupied in their rejection of God, he let them go into captivity. Now God says he was crushed by their adulterous heart, which is what people experience in life, indeed. Adultery is empty people inside. They don't feel anybody. God was crushed in their eyes. Their eyes were always on the things that they idolized. Their eyes went wherever their hearts were. That is how it works on a physical level too. That is why the law of God is expansive, so expansive. Today, we could idolize the false belief that the law is done away and that God will like me and take me just as I am. No repentance necessary. Just say that you give your life to the Lord and that's it. Well, we can idolize our own pet theory about how to raise our children. And there are many, many, many theories, brethren, out there that men have come up with. It could be our own pet theory or how God's law is out of date. You know, many people say that today. Oh, God's law is out of date. Bible is out of date. And, uh, you know, uh, it's it cannot be taken seriously. Our eyes or our thoughts could continually be drawn to, let's say, something better than what our designer and maker in his supreme wisdom has faithfully held out to us. Adultery in the letter or in the spirits, again, against our mate, is just a type of being adulterous toward God. The house of Israel, through their adultery netted captivity, along with its harshness, instead of the answered prayers and the interventions that come from a close relationship with God. In Matthew chapter 25, we are going now to add these verses because it'll, it broadens Christ's perspective of how 
we do or don't feel one another's needs. In Matthew 25, Christ says, Then he will also say to those on the left, on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not come to visit me. Verse 44. Uh, then those are now, now they're going to respond. Then those, they also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you go hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly I say to you, and as much as you did not do to it to one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into the eternal life. <coughs> so from these words, brethren, we see that Christ makes a crystal clear point how we treat virtually anyone else in terms of laying down our lives for them is exactly how we treat Him, Him, the very Messiah. Now, we, we were just looking at the commandment on, on adultery. We could apply this and we do apply this to all of the commandments. What if someone we know has, has, has gone off track and in some areas, you know, that could cost them their spiritual life? You know, like the man in Corinth who was committing sexual sin and no one there wanted to make waves and say what was desperately needed. It wouldn't have been a pleasant thing, but you know, to stop forward, step forward and fill that need. Well, none of us would want to, right? But by ignoring it, you know, many, many commandments are being broken in the spirit. Many needs are not being met. Not going to that person with the truth of the matter in love, uh, you know, is the spiritual equivalent of lying. Well, not going to that person in order to get him uh, or her back on track is a spiritual equivalent of stealing that life away from the one who has purchased it with the blood of Christ. Now we have to see the spiritual impact, you see. Are we willing, are we fulfilling, are we willing to do it and are we fulfilling the needs of others? Now, not intervening due to our own version of what we think love is and how it ought to be expressed is bowing down and worshipping a false image. It's not the image of God's mind. It's a false image that we claim is God's mind. All these options are not intervening. All those options of not intervening, you know, to fill the person's need, there, there is, for all of them, there is zero love in any of any of these options. But to lay down one's life and fill those needs, even when it's very difficult, is to keep the inside and is to keep the spirit of the law, which comes from the inside. You know, the desire comes from the inside. And it's not always easy to do, of course. Now, there will be peace of mind when we do it. There will be great hope for that person who must have gone astray and uh, instead of impending doom, that person will be growing in confidence in God rather than in self. Again, we, as we contemplate the dynamic spiritual life where miraculous things are happening, there is an answer, there is answered prayer. It comes sometimes, it's yes, sometimes it's no. But you know that God is there. We know this sort of life is linked to laying our own life down by fulfilling or by filling the needs of others. We have also established that the greatest needs of all people everywhere are spiritual in nature and are defined by God's Ten Commandments. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. This is now for us to think about ourselves, to think about how we stand. Jeremiah 23, 29. Uh, my 
23, let's go to 29, and then we'll take a look at verse 30 as well. So this is, again, for us to think about ourselves. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? You see, Brendan, God's word is like a consuming fire. It's like a hammer that breaks the hardest rocks. The granite granite is the hardest one that, as far as I know. Well, that is the nature of God's word. Verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who steal my word, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who use their, their tongues and say, he says. Well, what is the context here? Well, you see, God's word consumes and breaks everything in its path that does not lead to life or love. God is against those who steal his words. The prophets that God refers to here are false prophets. That means that they are not really prophets at all. These people couldn't fill the needs of others because they were trying to fill their own emptiness. They were trying to promote something that was not of God at all. Verse 32. Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yes, I did not send any, or I did not send them or command them, therefore they shall not profit these people at all, says the Lord. You see, the false prophets, brethren, the false Christian preachers after all, they twist God's word to their own will, and then they teach it to others. Now, because they have stolen God's words by twisting them, they have violated the Eighth, com the eighth Commandment. They have stolen the truth from those they have shared their reckless lies with. You know, they violate the Ninth Commandment against lying. Those who believe their lies are being separated from the one true God, well, here is the violation of the First Commandment. When in our emptiness we search for others whom we might get to agree with and uh, thereby make us feel justified in our own pet truth that we want so desperately, well, have we not done so because we covet? We covet the fullness of God, we covet His glory. When we feel empty, we want something different. So there is commandment number 10. Well, are we not taking God's name in vain in the spirit when we who represent his name do so with our own twisted view of God's truth? God's commandments are broad, brethren, much, much broader than physical things. They cover everything that we do. The culture we live in today could very accurately be described as one in which the majority do what is right in their own eyes. Now, we are not unaffected by the world around there is a reason that we can feel bogged down spiritually and that our prayers are not going anywhere. A reason that we may not feel close to God or to, to brethren as we should and as we would like to. In Matthew 24, verse 13, well-known verse, I can, you know, I can give it to you, quote even without reading it in the Bible because it says it's the uh, sentence which, 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 you, which I dread dread more than any other sentences in the Bible. So in Matthew twenty four thirteen, Christ said that because of lawlessness, the rejecting of God's law, the love of many would grow cold. Now the fact is that we cannot have the fullness that we all innately desire when we knowingly or unknowingly are re rejecting the words that lead to life. That is why we need to understand the fullness of the commandments and how broad and encompassing they are. We read in Romans that love is the fulfillment of the law. Well, you see, the way to dynamic spiritual life doesn't come by trying to fill ourselves in our own selfish way. In Isaiah 58, the verses preceding verse 6 describe that. And then in verse 6, it says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Well, these are miraculous things that are happening. We achieve these things by yielding ourselves to God's law, and that is how the negative are the negatives are overcome. That is how we can, you know, we get rid of the bonds of wickedness and the burdens and the oppressions and the yokes. Verse seven. 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring uh, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover, it, cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Well, after we begin to yield to our expensive land, expansive law, that is, so we begin to lead to that law which is so expansive and we see it for what it is and how broad and encompassing it is, we begin to fulfill it then. We begin to fulfill it. Because that is when we begin to meet the needs of others. Verse 8 and 9. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The story, that is the glory of the Lord, shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing, pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. You see, when we begin laying our life down by means of filling the physical, yes, but especially the spiritual needs of others, it lights up our whole being. It lights us up, you know, and it gives us strength and there will be miraculous things that happen in our life and in the lives of others who are affected by the needs being met. God will hear us and he will answer our prayers. Psalm chapter 40, well, the Psalm number 40, that is, we have Christ's example to look to. Psalm 40 and verse 8. This is David, but he is describing Jesus Christ in this case. Psalm 40 verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Well, you see, David is speaking of Christ in this particular verse, and this gives us a very mature perspective. Christ delighted in doing our Father's will. He took great pleasure in laying down his life to fill our needs. He was happy to do so. He was happy to do it for our sakes. And we were not even friends of his. He did it for us when we were in our sins. Now, why and how was this great love given? Well, God's law in its vast fullness was written in the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. You see, it was not a list of ten things that we do and we don't do. Christ saw the law as exceedingly broad. That is how David came to see the law as well. God's law guides our every thought. You see, but we need to get that into our mind. Psalm 119 verse 97. Psalm 119 verse 97. David was a man whom God said was a very, a man after his own heart. A man after his own mind. Now, David, as we know, developed over time, brethren. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. A, vi a vast understanding of that law has governed and motivated, indeed, Christ. And therefore, the Father as well, is what David developed in his mind. Psalm 119, famous and the longest Psalm 119, verse 97, Psalm 119, verse 97, how, Oh, how I love thy law! It is my meditation all the day. You see, if we want God's exceedingly broad commandments to guide us to have a heart like David, then we have got to do what David did. We've got to understand how it impacts every little thought. The commandments go, you know, everywhere. They go to every thought and every action and, uh, you know, every action that we do every single day. When we look back at the end of a day, we should not just see one law that came, you know, uh, into play during the day. We could think, well, I think uh, I could have lied to my neighbor today when I was at fault, but I didn't. You see, we're imperfect people, but when we do so in that way, when we admit our error, or whatever this case might be, by not lying, that person 
has filled perhaps unknown needs that a neighbor has got by setting an example of a person who fears God and who puts no other gods before him. Now, an example is set, you know. That's pretty unusual for people to not tell a white life, white, white lie, that is, when, you know, when they want to save face. So many people just resort to white lie. Well, that individual had a chance to steal, which is number eight, for example, etc., etc. He had the perfect chance to steal this man's exposure to God's way of life. He could have taken God's name in vain, and uh, it was nearby, and uh, he could have taken God's name in vain. In vain, you know, uh, uh, by, again, doing things our own way. There was a perfect chance to steal this man's exposure to God's way of life. God's name in vain could have been taken by setting an example unworthy of his calling, of the calling of that person. Instead, he filled a need. He laid his life down in that sense. The laws encompass everything we do. We're in Psalm 119. Let's go to verse 98 and 99. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. In verse 99, I have put, I have, that is, more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Well, you see, that is how it works for David. That is how it works for us as well. The more we think about these things, the wiser we will become. It should be happening in our minds. You see, brethren, in a dynamic spiritual life is a process. Why was David's understanding of God's heart and mind so much more than, you know, why, why was it so much than others? Why was it so better? Why was his understanding of of that so much more than other people. Well, certainly it's not because of a competition. There was no competition in that regard, and there is not even today. It is a way of life. It is because he did those things that he came to understand. You know, David wanted to understand how things worked. He wanted to understand the law, the law of God, he, the mind of God, which is, you know, reflected in, in, in God's law. Now, when we came to understand those things, well, that is what that is what he came to do. When he came to understand those things, he came to do them. The same is with us. You see, the more we do the fullness of the law, the more we will come to understand. It is a never-ending growth process. As it says in that lovely song, never-ending story. Indeed, it's a never-ending story, as long as we will be in this flesh and with this blood. So you see, with that, the more deeply we will be able to fill the needs of others. And the more deeply we will be able to love. And this all indeed leads to a dynamic and miraculous spiritual life.